Cool. <laughs> well, welcome. <laughs> I hope you mean to be here. Um, and if you don't, you should stay. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're up and running. So that's a good sign. Anyways, okay. Hi everyone, my name's Lauren. I'm actually gonna go through and introduce the team or I'm going to have the panel introduce themselves, starting at the end with Luke. Hi, uh, my name is Luke Wirtz. I am a solution architect at Palantir.net. Steve Persh, lead developer advocate at Pantheon. Hi, my name's Alozie Wosu. I'm a Drupal developer with uh, at professional services at Acquia. I'm Sarah Thrasher. I'm also a Drupal developer at professional services at Acquia. Um, I, also, I specialize in front end, though. Hi, I'm Jason Inner. I'm the front end lead in professional services at Acquia. Cool. Oh, and I'm Lauren Burrows. I'm a senior project, um, or I'm a senior engineer and project lead at Palantir.net. Um, I guess that that seems kind of important. Um, and we're here to talk a little bit about um, work-life balance um, and what that looks like in our lives. Um, time, time management, taking care of yourself, engaging in culture, working in teams, managing teams. Um, we're, we're here to celebrate humans and being human, um, but I'm a firm believer in trusting in our robot overlords because we're faulty um, and they're less so. Um, so we're gonna time box each of these topics. We'll have, we'll go through, um, I'm gonna set a timer that will tell us when we need to stop. Um, and we'll go through each one of these topics, talking a little bit, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So think of some cues, and I'll hope that we have some A's. <laughs> um, <laughs> So there are a lot of advantages to working remotely. Um, a lot of employees are more satisfied um, because they can control a lot of things. You can build a really great work, re working environment remotely um, if you kind of know what you're doing and think about it. Um, it reduces a lot of unscheduled absences for various reasons that you might normally need to take off. Sometimes you can kind of balance that out a little bit when you're working remotely. Um, going back to like that employee satisfaction, it in empowers us as employees to take control of our schedule um, and how we integrate that with our life. Um, we spend less time commuting, so less traffic, less headaches, um, less jams, less accidents, less CO2 in the environment, all good things. Um, and it gives you a lot of flexibility of where you work, when you work, how you work. Um, you know, you can, you can work remotely from anywhere as long as you have internet access. So that might mean that you get to explore outside of work passions um, and availability. Before we really dive right in, um, I pulled this quote offline, I think it's awesome. Um, but I kind of wanted to give a little backstory about the session before we dive into um, the panel, which is, I had this idea and I've really been marinating it in my mind um, since about last summer and possibly even a year, kind of thinking about um, this is a topic that really spoke to me. Um, and as I, I originally thought about proposing this as a full session by myself at Bad Camp, um, and as I was sort of throwing around that idea last summer, um, I was talking to my husband about it, who, when I told him the idea, just looked at me really quiet and said, you can't talk about that, um, which I agree. Um, he... He said, you have no right to get up in front of a room of people and tell them about work-life balance. And I said, yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> um, and I think some of my, my panelists would agree that maybe they don't either. Um, so I don't have all the answers, and I'm not very good at this all the time. Um, but I do know the things that we tell ourselves when we say, it's OK to not take care of myself. It's OK to skip doing the things that I love because it's just this once or I just have this one deadline. Um, and so I say that to give you an idea of where I'm coming from and to say that I'm not perfect and I'm definitely human um, and I'm just trying to figure out the best way to do myself. And I hope that some of our experiences can guide you guys. Um, so yeah, I will start the timer at five minutes um, and I will let 
Luke Takeover talking a little bit about some time management. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I definitely resonate with what Lauren said, learn from my failures, um, and I'm happy to talk about them and, and some of the successes that I've, uh, I've found for myself and how they've worked for me. Um, for me, I can't really think about time management without also thinking about space. Like space time is a whole thing if you're a casual <laughs> astrophysics fan like I am. Um, but understanding like the context of, of what it means to be employed. For, for me, I'm a full-time employee uh, at Palantir. That means I'm selling eight hours of my day to my employer and understanding that that's the time constraint. And with that context, not only is it important to know what are you doing with that time, but why are you doing it? And so for me, the, the answer to that question of why has changed over time. When, uh, when I first started uh, working uh, remotely before I worked at Palantir, I really saw uh, a high degree of connection with my coworkers. And what I wanted was a high degree of work-life integration. So my office space, the, the space that I had to work in, it was right off of our living room. It was this uh, lovely room that had French doors into, into our living room. And at night, when I was done with work, I would uh, move over and sit on the couch and uh, spend time with my wife. And work was still right there. And that was OK. My notifications were still on on my phone. And uh, occasionally, I'd get a, a ping or an email from a coworker after our normal working hours. And, that was okay for me. That's what I wanted at that time. And as, as time progressed and our lives changed, uh, we were expecting our first child. I realized that uh, what, I, what I wanted wasn't necessarily a high degree of work-life integration, but work-life balance. And um, so I, I started renovating our basement so I could move my office space and have separate space where I could like close the door and not see it, not think about it. Also knowing that there was going to be a tiny human being running around and I spend a lot of time on calls and uh, imagining uh, being on client calls and having, having a, a small person tugging at my, at my shirt or uh, popping their head into, uh, into the frame of the video conference. It happens anyway, but you know. It gets one you can... on the news. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently. Uh, yeah, I think anybody who's worked from home has had that BBC dad moment. Uh, <laughs> it's a routine thing at, at my house. I, I'm just used to saying, excuse the Jedi who's walking behind me. He's only five, don't worry. He's still in training. Um, but yeah, so understanding uh, as, time, as time progressed, like what is it that I'm trying to get out of work and what is it that I'm trying to offer and how does that impact my relationships and my family and my physical space and being okay to to change that over time but to really have that grounding in that context so that you can critically evaluate it, is this working is am i succeeding am i failing what do i need to change in order to to feel so feel luke better? is it working uh i think so uh i uh we're getting ready for a massive change in my family. Uh, we're giving up our uh, almost 4,000 square foot house to live in a travel trailer full time and travel. So four people and like, you know, 130 square feet. Uh, I described it as a tin can going down the highway. Uh, but yeah, my my uh, relationship to the space that I work in is is changing, and it's a constant conversation with us because. Uh, I, so I used to be a developer. I used to write code uh, and work on tickets. I don't do that anymore. Now I uh, write a lot of contracts and proposals. And when I'm not writing those, I'm talking on the phone like five or six or seven hours a day sometimes. So I'm curious, when you're talking on the phone for five or six or seven hours a day and assuming that you still have other work to be doing outside of that, how do you manage that without working 12 hour days, hopefully? Um, yeah, so setting, setting reasonable expectations for yourself and being able to communicate those 
to the people with whom you're working is key, I think. Like being transparent about your time and your availability that you have to work on things and being able to estimate, yeah, that proposal is going to take me half a day. That means I'm not going to be able to make this meeting. I'm sorry. And being able to communicate that and being okay saying no and disappointing people sometimes. Speaking of time, you're at it. Um, <laughs> Subtle, Lauren. It goes by fast. <laughs> See how I got you there? Um, interesting. Okay. Um, Sarah, do you want to talk to us a little bit about taking care of yourself? So, so that, that travel trailer anecdote, that's just like the awesome side of being remote. <laughs> um, I've been uh, fully remote for about three years now. And before that, um, most, most of the jobs that I had were like, um, sure, you can have like a day or two, you know, remote. And like, that, that's always great. Um, my first job, I spent about two years um, being fully remote because it was like a small startup. And I had just started doing like design and web development type stuff and I was so anxious to like prove myself and like not you know like <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing really like I've got to work really hard and like you know when people say like oh you're, you're working remote like what are you, you're gonna like sit there and play Nintendo all day I did not sit there and play Nintendo all day I sat at my desk I would not necessarily have like the lights on because you know I got in there in the morning I would like look up and it's dark <laughs> you know I'm sitting here still you know my boyfriend would come back and be like you're still doing it like I, I was doing a lot of things right I was like, I have my own desk, I have my own office, but, you know, in some respects, like, that was catastrophically wrong, and I did actually get seriously burnt out. Well, so how did you, you know? yeah, so how did you know it was catastrophically wrong? I quit without another job. <laughs> that's a, that's a was, sure sign. And this is, this is, like, a pit early on in my career that I spent another several years digging myself out of, basically, like, we, we did a lot of things um, that were pretty cool in that company, but... It wasn't like, everyone else was remote, you know, but I, I guess maybe this was before, like, everybody had Slack, you know, um, there wasn't Hangouts, we didn't do a lot of, like, on-site stuff, um, and I just got really isolated. Um, I wasn't, like, communicating to people that, like, I didn't have, you know, as much, like, actual interesting work to do as I could, and, like, I would just sit there and, <laughs> you know, try to do what I could do, but it was, like, sort of disconnected from what everyone else was doing, because I was, like, the designer, <laughs> and everybody else was sitting there doing Java. Um, so this was like one of the like driving things behind that imposter syndrome talk that I gave last year. But like, you know, you can really do damage to yourself if you're in an environment that doesn't support doing this properly, which I do have now. You know, like we're most of my team is remote. Um, everybody's in like different time zones and stuff. We have like Slack, Hangouts, Zoom calls. Um, you know, people like check in on each other. Um, a lot of our clients are also remote, you know, so that doesn't hurt. So do you feel like, um, it, do you feel like the, the constant, like the Slack technology and a lot of the collaboration that exists now yeah. help, like helps you? Yes. Yeah. And the robots, the robots are definitely like a thing. Like well, um, our robot overlords, <laughs> you know, um, when you actually like make an effort to not do the thing I was doing, um, to like get out, like walk, talk to people, you know, make meals for yourself, um, you know, and I'm, I'm in like a totally different place in my career, I like literally everything now. Um, like I even, you know, I have a three-year-old, so um, you know, like all this stuff about being remote, being so much better, like, you know, like enabling you to like stay in your job and everything, that, that's all true. And then also when I'm on like, you know, I have Slack on my phone still, <laughs> but when, when my three-year-old's at home and like I'm like checking up on somebody's messages, he's like, mommy, put the phone in your pocket. <laughs> you know, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm going to put the phone in my pocket. So it's, it's really, I mean, it's not even your robot overlord at that point. It's, it's your <laughs> tiny human tiny, overlord. Tiny human overlord, yeah. <laughs> but, like, it's, it's just really important to um, have some kind of mechanisms to, like, make sure that you don't, like, get into this point where you're just basically, like, uh, de you know, devouring yourself. So, um, so what does that look like for you? Like, what are your mechanisms <clears throat> to, to keep yourself honest? Uh, I actually do, I think we were talking about this a bit, like, um, I have, like, an app. Um, that somebody on the Drupal Slack recommended Fatima, um, where like you actually do tracking, like you know you assign yourself like a, a number for your day, and like it also like ties into like you know like uh, walking and things like that, and then it, it does little reports. Um, th that that was like a pretty cool thing, but you can also like write about it. Um, actually, just giving yourself permission to like you know get up and do things helps, um, and <clears throat> also like. I think this is kind of important for like that imposter syndrome or that whole mindset. Um, when you're like trying to look back at what you were doing and putting like your timesheet, if you're, if you're billable or um, however else you like account for what you've been doing, 
don't underreport. You know, don't be like, well, you know, somebody else wouldn't have had to look that up. So I'll just get to put 15 minutes because that's like really what I would, you know. Well, I'm curious. Um, <laughs> so I'm curious as a as a remote employee, do you ever, um, do you ever like get up in the middle of a task and go answer? I, it's theoretically a landline or, yes. or yeah, 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 yeah. switch over yeah, laundry yeah. or like, something oh, else. Like, yeah, how do you, hold on, how do you accommodate for that when you're tracking time? Well, I mean, if, you know, you can start and stop it and everything like that. But, like, you should never, like, purposely try to trim it is what I'm saying. Like, make this your real time because, like, your, your coworkers and your boss cannot see you. You know, they don't know you're still sitting there. They don't know that you're, like, tearing your hair out. The only way that, like, your coworkers or your boss will know that, like, you're getting overloaded um, is if you talk to them or if they like see, you know, all right, you're putting in 10 hour days regularly, whatever. Um, you got, you've got to have some sort of method for yourself and like other people to like dive in and go like, whoa, <laughs> what are you doing yourself? Um, and, and also like just maybe we need another person on this project. Like we've got enough work for three people. We only have two. Um, so <clears throat> it's both like something you can like attempt to regulate yourself and that that gives you like you know, an opportunity to talk to your boss about like maybe you're taking on too many hours. Maybe I'd like to do some more like investment in my skills instead of like, you know, whatever I've been putting too much time into. Um, that type of thing. Cool. That's where I'm gonna cut you off. Okay. Um, okay, Alozi, will you tell us a little bit about engaging in culture while you're while you're remote? Uh, sure. So, <clears throat> um, I think. Well, first, like. I think defining uh, culture, I, I, I'm thinking about the, the several definitions of it and then like one of them being, you know, community, uh, you know, the, uh, whether it's the Drupal community itself, your work community, or your, you know, home, you know, home-based community um, uh, at where you are. And uh, then in addition to that, then, I mean, uh, culture as, you know, um, you know, engaging with your hobbies, engaging with your interests, and so forth. Um, I think to step back to the community aspect of it um, and to lay the groundwork. Like for me, um, I'm. It's it's kind of a contradiction for me to be sitting in front of a room because I'm a very shy <laughs> and introverted kind of person generally. <laughs> so I do have to make an effort to make sure that I step out and see other human beings and speak in front of other human beings from, you know, on, on uh, regular intervals. So what, uh, does that effort, what does that effort look like to you? Like, how do you, how do you keep yourself in check? Um, the, I'll say that uh, I've started watching my own internal barometer, uh, and I know that um, if it's been a couple days since I've actually had like a full real conversation with you know someone face to face or someone like that, something like that, that okay, uh, I need to you know step back and make sure that I'm uh, having uh, a bit more engagement, uh, you know, at a person to person level, or um, you know, just kind of uh, making sure that when I'm, I, I basically do try to check in with myself uh, weekly. Uh, um, and I, I have, uh, I, I essentially have like a little notepad, uh, you know, with, you know, I, I use a Mac, so uh, with the notepad app, um, I basically gave myself a little template for the week. And at the end of the week, uh, there's a check in with myself, little reminder. Um, now, what, <laughs> so what happens, what does it look like? What does your life look like when you, when you don't do that? Like when you don't check in with yourself? Right. Yeah. There are definitely, you know, there, there are the things that you wish or you set for yourself to do that you aspire to do. And there's what you actually do. And uh, what I notice is that, you know, sometimes it, it ebbs and flows. It can be in cycle. Like, you know, I can really, you know, be on top of and attentive to the self-care aspects of my life. And then, uh, you know, uh, it might go a week or, or two weeks where I realize I've kind of been pushing that aside. So, um, you know, trying to, and, and even that is data in a sense, because I can see, I could look back and see that, oh yeah, I was really on top of checking in with myself there in the past, you know, and, and that last week, yeah, I didn't, uh, check in and oh because I was feeling stressed about you know XYZ or or you know I had I had this thing that I really had to finish or whatever and I put that off and you know uh, so do you get concerned about 
how how that comes off to other people when or or does it come off to other people when when you're sort of pushing things back in the backlog of life? Certainly. I, I think well, again, as an introvert, I think it's very easy to try to crawl back into your hovel and think, oh, you know, if I sit still long enough, no one will see. <laughs> you know? So, um, yeah, that's, you know, and, and maybe that's true to an extent. However, um, you, you know, you, you kind of remind yourself, especially working in the Drupal community, working in Drupal, you know, it is, unlike, again, unlike other software products, you're you know, you work to be a part of a community. You uh, you uh, start in it to be a part of a community, and that's one of the benefits of it. And so I realize, you know, you know, having that motivation to get into this work uh, to begin with, um, I remind myself, okay, well, or, or I'm reminded that if I haven't been engaging, then that you know part of me that you know uh, wanted that to be part of my life is not being satisfied. So. Um, and I know that, and and basically those things will come up when you find yourself at ends with yourself. And you know, I, I think with those check-ins, you you realize, okay, I'm kind of at ends with myself here. I don't know from what exactly. Uh, and then you kind of start going through the inventory, and maybe part of it is that you haven't engaged with the community, uh, you haven't engaged with uh, you know culture, and and you sort of uh, you know, you, and th those things that sort of. Uh, you feed the soul. And uh, so I think in doing those checks, the self-care checks, one of those things that you do have to look at in addition to, am I you know, drinking and <laughs> drink, you know, drinking water and am I you know, taking a shower every day and so forth is, you know, am I actually engaging with other people? Am I engaging with um, those things that are really of interest to me, uh, you know, either cult culturally or community wise? So. So we are out of time, but I have a question that's just been itching in the back of my mind, sure. um, <laughs> which is as an introvert and as somebody who works from home, what does engagement look like when you're not at DrupalCon? Like how, how do you, how do you keep, how do you keep that engagement and culture fresh in your life? So, um, when, when, you, I'm, <laughs> yeah. when you can't be there, yeah, when you can't be there directly, uh, I know one of the things that, again, you know, uh, I, I live in Providence. I, I'm based in Providence, Rhode Island, and we we have a, a local meetup, Drupal PVD, uh, that uh, and they meet every, we, we meet uh, uh, once per month. Um, so I, you know, look at my calendar and realize, yeah, I've uh, you know, missed a few times. So let me uh, go in and see see some of the uh, see some familiar faces and you know and and some new faces and and uh, make sure that I'm talking to people uh, uh, about that. Um, there are also uh, local community organizations that either um, you know. You know, work in you know arts related space which I'm which I'm interested in or uh, uh, as well as the technology uh, uh, spaces or their intersections there so um, you know making sure that I'm adding that to my time to engage with them as well um, and you know sort and in general just trying to find those kinds of things that um, yeah, are either available locally or, or trying to find them awesome I have an accountability trick Go to your local meetup and volunteer to speak once, and they'll keep pestering you to see if you want to come back. Yeah, that's a, that's a great one. <laughs> I'm going to pass it over um, to Steve um, to have him talk a little bit about what it's like to work with teams that are not fully remote. Sure. So, again, I work at Pantheon, and Pantheon is based in San Francisco. That's where the majority of the company is. But for the team that I'm on, developer relations, it's a seven-person team, most of whom are not in San Francisco. At this point, we have, like, one and a half people in San Francisco, one person splitting his time. So uh, we, as a team, need to operate remotely. But, of course, we visit the San Francisco office somewhat regularly. And when we do... Our goal is, is not so much to have a balanced day. If I'm only in the San Francisco office for three days out of three months, or it, really in the last year, I think maybe four days out of, out of a whole year, I need to make that time as valuable as possible. Our, our developer relations team can be somewhat set apart from other parts of the company, and I wonder, like, do those other parts of the company remember that I exist. So the, those days in the San Francisco office might be nine solid hours of meetings with a bunch of different de departments. And I would not want all of my work days to be like that. That would be terrible to have nothing but uh, 
you know, morning to night meetings. But I find it acceptable for a couple days out of the year to go to the San Francisco office, meet with as many people as possible, remind them, remind them that I exist, make sure that I'm bringing um, the appropriate energy, make sure that I'm bringing uh, a positive attitude so that for those few days a year that those, those people see me, that may not be traveling to conferences as, as well and seeing me there, that I make a good impression for myself. And then for our, our developer relations team, we occasionally have our own retreats. And lately, I, I think we've realized that we need to rethink what is the purpose of that time together. If we're going to the San Francisco office and trying to meet with as, as many departments as possible, sure, then it's okay to have a jam-packed schedule with a bunch of different topics. But if we're coming together as a team, the best usage of our time might not be to try and get through our whole backlog of topics that we think we need to talk about. We have an internal backlog of like, you know, we should really talk about the way we're doing these kinds of trainings. But we don't necessarily need to get through a giant backlog, backlog of an internal topics for those two or three days that we're on a team retreat. I, I find it more helpful to think of those team retreats as an opportunity to practice the way we want to work as a team when we are remote. Like often being in an office gives you nonverbal cues. You can do all, all sorts of things to work more efficiently as a team if you're in the same physical space. When we're working as a remote team that's often working on a bunch of different things at once, sometimes it can just be hard for us to function as a team. So I now think of those you know, couple days a quarter that we're in the same place, maybe doing a retreat, as an opportunity for us to practice how we work together with all the benefits of being in the same room rather than we only have two days together, we need to get through all these topics, we only have 15 minutes on this one topic, get through the whole agenda. I, I don't think that's all that beneficial for us as a so team. So how does that, how does that in-person FaceTime translate? Like how do you keep, how do you, how do you, how do you take that practice that you have in person and bring it back to being offline mm -hmm. and in person. Yeah, so, so one, one thing we've started doing recently is just scheduling long video calls for co-working on a specific topic. So uh, it, it used to be that the only times we would see each other would be on like very specific meetings that were time boxed and felt like we had to get through, <laughs> get through an agenda. Now we're more likely to do meetings where, um, well, yes, we still have those agenda-driven meetings, but we'll have some, you know, a two-hour block to co-work on Pantheon for trainers, or to co-work on our DrupalCon presentations, and they're, they feel more like uh, a, a casual working relationship you might have with a person in the cubicle next to you. But the, the time boxing is nice. It's not all day of drive-by cubicle interruptions. It's, it's you know, two hours for you and your coworker to work on either the same thing or work on related topics and maybe have you know, 15 minutes of silence where you're just on the video call, both typing in different sections, the Google Doc, and then ask questions uh, as needed. That's, that's been a really nice thing for us in the past couple months. Do you guys ever have any problems um, as a you know as a as a team where you have some people in office and some people not? Do you guys ever have any problems like managing that communication and making sure that everybody's sort of kept in the loop? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's there's stuff that gets passed around by word of mouth in the San Francisco office that we just don't hear about until later, and and I don't have a great uh, great solution for that. Uh, other than I would point point people towards the four kitchens blog, Four Kitchens, a, a Drupal agency. They've been very public about the way they're switching from an in-office culture to a remote first mentality. One of their specific tips is if you're doing video calls and some people are remote and in video call isolation, then everybody should be. If there are two people in an office, they shouldn't be in a big echoey conference room on a video call with you know, four other people in isolation. Everyone should have their own video stream and it works much better that way. Thanks. And with that, I'm going to cut you off. All right. Um, but I appreciate the tip. Uh, Jason, do you want to talk to us a little bit about um, managing teams and being managed? Sure, absolutely. Hey, everyone. Um, I've actually been working remotely for 11 years straight. Um, and uh, I've made a lot of mistakes, especially at the early beginning. Um, and what I try to do is now that I'm managing, you know, six, six different people remotely is try to use the mistakes that I use to help other people and try to identify warning signs. Um, kind of like Sarah said, uh, I think a lot of times we're, it's hard to be transparent, if, especially if you're working uh, from home remotely at the beginning as far as like, you know, communicating your struggles. 
and things like that. So, you know, initially working from home, it was my, my one goal is to keep working from home, right? So a lot of it was just no matter what it took, just keep working. So I ended up in the emergency room uh, a couple times and was like, you know, I need to change what I'm doing. And like we all discussed earlier, you know, not to deflate what we all do, because it's all impressive, but we don't work in an emergency room, right? Like, no one's going to die if the div floats the wrong way. <laughs> Entities aren't merging, you know. I don't know if you talk to my clients. Yeah, well, <laughs> you'd be surprised. Yeah. Um, so a lot of it is just about uh, not only that, but just communicating expectations, right? And also being a, a good person to manage, like communicating to your manager if you're struggling, um, Suffering in silence is just, it's, it's rough, right? So we only have like, you know, our body and mind for the long haul, and it's not a sprint. So we need to like preserve, you know, like our mental stability and things we go through. Um, and just communicating, just being super transparent, you know? Like at the beginning, I was like so worried about like not being transparent and just, like there would be weekends I would just work because I was stuck, because I was too embarrassed to ask for help. It's just, it's stupid, right? So like just clearly communicating, I'm struggling, you know, I need help, can I just show you this? I think that's key. It does, that way you don't feel as disconnected and siloed, like you're just suffering by yourself. As a, you know, as a person leading teams, do you, are there ever any signs that you see on your team where you're like, I have a bad feeling about so-and-so and I need to make a point to reach out to them? Absolutely, yeah, and I think that comes with, um, you know, meeting regularly, video chat, and just catching cues, right? Because, you know, we're all humans, we're all scared, you know, it's just, we all go through, like, different uh, levels and pitfalls, so, like, without being prying, you know, it's okay to, like, ask, how are you doing? Um, are you running into things? Are you frustrated? Like, you know, our, our job's very frustrating, right? And if you have someone to help just, you know, review code with you or talk through things, it helps honestly a ton. So um, just having that uh, cadence with people and understanding what it means to like communicate for their style, not for your style, because we're all so different and we all have like really different backgrounds. So just communicating for that person's style, because your, your ultimate goal is for them to be successful, right? Like I care more about being a teammate than whatever job we're at now, right? So I think that's important to kind of keep in perspective as well. So how do you, how do you send that message to the team that you're like, you know, I'm here to lead you, but like I don't want you to feel like you can't come talk to me. How do you how do you send them that message that you're there to to really empower them and help them at their job? Yeah, just I mean, essentially communicating that I want you to do well, and if you're stuck or frustrated, just come talk to me, right? Or we can get other people to help. But like you know, we're a team, especially like a front end team. We're all going to be confused, frustrated, get stuck, like just have a bad day. Like we have bad days, so like having other people to help like jump in, you know, and it doesn't have to be a lot of time. It's 15 minutes here, 15 minutes there. It goes a long way, you know, especially for, for people that, you know, um, have more trouble speaking up and saying, you know, like I'm running into this or I'm having this issue. Is that my time? <laughs> yeah. Sorry. 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 Um, yeah. Teamwork. Yeah. Teamwork makes the dream work. Um, uh, do I know? And I was really on here. Just like a... yeah. um, I was gonna say, so, so when you do have somebody who is, who is um, less vocal and less likely you know, to come to you, or maybe this is their first time mm -hmm. um, working remotely, like, yeah. how, do you, how do you encourage that conversation? Or do you, do you ever find that maybe, maybe somebody's not likely to talk to you because you're leading them? Yeah, but also I think people can tell if you're a transparent person, right? Like they can tell if you're like, listen, you're going to have different jobs in your life. You're going to have different projects. Like, I don't even remember the projects or the code I wrote 11 years ago, but, you know, <laughs> so, like, it's okay to say I'm frustrated, I'm running into this, and even if they're like, yeah, that's fine, but they're, like, a little bit hesitant, just keep, just keep opening the door, and eventually, you know, like, when they're comfortable, they'll talk to you about stuff. Metaphorical door. Yeah. Metaphorical door. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Awesome. That actually is that time. Um, so I wanted to leave most of this open um, for Q&A. Um, and I would invite anybody up to the mic um, if they do have questions um, for anybody on the panel or just all of us in general. Um, and if people don't start talking, I will. Um, what, what are your thoughts on co-working spaces? Um, so 
I've I've worked at a co-working space before, um, and I currently am in a situation right now where um, I work for Palantir.net. And we're a fully distributed firm, um, but for the sake of the client that I work with, I'm in there. I'm in our client's office two days a week, um, and so in comparison to co-working spaces are great, um, but they're great if they if you go consistently. Um, and I find the same thing. You know, one of the things I struggle with right now is. I have everything set up at home the way I like it, but when I have to go into the client office, like I get thrown off my groove, and it takes a little bit to adapt um, to to a new environment and a new working situation and a new laptop setup. And so, my answer on co-working spaces is always, you know, whatever you're gonna do, do consistently, um, because it's it's easier to keep yourself going on that momentum. I don't know if any. Uh, I was just gonna say that. Uh, about a decade ago, I worked at what you'd call a startup incubator. I don't know if it was called that at, at the time. Uh, but as, as a more introverted person, I find that it didn't really benefit me because it didn't have a mechanism for encouraging interaction. So it felt like I'm surrounded by these people, but I don't know if I should be chatting them up. Uh, and it, it felt more it felt more alienating. It was kind of like the worst of both worlds, like the distraction, but not the the social benefits. Yeah. We have access to one in my area, and like I find that usually when I'm going there, it's actually to meet up with, with coworkers. Like we'll go, and we actually have like a space in there for it's 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 kind of like the office, but not really. But it's it's mostly our sales team, so we, we do occasionally make arrangements to go there, and I think that's great, you know, because sometimes you do want to like break out and actually talk to people and get out of your house and put on pants and like all that. You pants know, are stuff. overrated. I definitely do that every day, <laughs> you know. But like it's a real it's 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 just good to be able to see people and. Yeah. Oh, see the line. But just to say, um, when I started working remotely, uh, a few friends of mine, peer, you know, peers, but not not at uh, who, who didn't work at the same company, uh, said, "Hey, I have office space. Come on down and uh, join me there." And I, you know, didn't take them up on their invitation for a while, and then finally, uh, you know, caught uh, one of them, at, you know, uh, uh, you know, on, on the. You know, just going out the, uh, that day, and he said, "Hey, you know, uh, if really, if you want to come through, uh, you know, it could be nice to just have some another body in the office just to hang out with, because he had an office space that was just him." So I started doing that, and I realized, you know, from time to time, that was yeah, it was actually really nice to just, even though we weren't working on the same stuff, uh, and uh, just to be in that space together to, you know, talk about, you know, Drupal in general, because he's also a uh, Drupaler, and uh, and uh, uh, just to, and to just talk talk about, you know, whatever, you know, th that was part of the having FaceTime, having, you know, getting out in the community and, you know, getting some culture too. So. Kind of like we're doing here. Kind of like we're doing here. So, yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. I was wondering if uh, you guys have any uh, experience or advice uh, for workers who are trying to get their organizations or companies to either include some remote options or transition to have a full remote option for their workers. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say um, I, I ran into this early on in my career as far as like uh, how it was being perceived as a remote worker, like thinking, OK, I know you want to work remote, wink, wink, you know, but you're like chilling out, playing Diablo, and then we'll <laughs> catch you eventually. Yeah, so I think a lot of it is just, you know, too, showing that there is a shift to people that can manage their own time remotely. And for me, I get way more done working remotely than I ever did in an office, right? The distractions, being able to manage your time, um, communicating uh, clearly, I get distracted super easy. So for me, it like worked really well for me, but it's not for everyone. Uh, you know, I worked with a lot, a lot of people that in an office that they worked uh, remote and it did not work out well. It wasn't a good fit maybe for their personality or where they are in their life. So I think just communicating that remote work isn't for everyone, but a lot of people find it more effective as an employee to work that way. And in addition to saying remote work isn't for everyone, it might not be for you right now. Like I, I was telling all of them earlier, my first job out of college was fully remote and I hated it. And I thought I can never work remote. I can never work for a remote team. I can't, I don't have the self-discipline. I don't have the dedication. I don't, I don't have any, I, I can't work in that environment. I can't feel siloed and left alone and be, still be responsible. Um, and, you know, what I learned was it wasn't right for me then. Um, and that doesn't mean it's not right for me ever. It just means things change. And, you know, 
your life is going to change um, and you're going to have different peaks and valleys in your where you're more human and where you're more career oriented um, and where your focus is different and, and that'll play a role as well. Yeah. I think if it's something that you're trying to introduce into an organization that may be like predisposed not to support uh, remote employees. I had an experience uh, in my first job out of college. I worked at the University of Cincinnati. They didn't uh, at the time offer any any kind of remote options. Um, and I knew that remote work would be a really good fit for me. I actually did remote schooling as a kid uh, from second grade all the way through 12th. I used VHS tapes and watched school on TV. So I, I felt like I was preparing to be a remote employee my entire life and then boom, my first job out of college. It's like, show up in the office and wear a tie. Um, <laughs> so I, uh, I actually used, uh, used a, a series of terrible snowstorms to my advantage. And uh, I, I lived at the bottom of a very, very steep hill and uh, we, ha we had campus closures one year, which is very rare in Cincinnati. We don't get all that much snow, honestly. But it was a particularly bad year, and so I would email my boss and say, I don't think I can make it up the hill. Rather than take a PTO day, you want me to keep working from home and like, try to hit these deadlines that we have? And that sounded okay to him. And from there, the proof of the pudding is in the pie, right? Like, show, demonstrate effectiveness, and it, <laughs> Certainly didn't introduce, you know, monumental change across the you know, 18th largest public university in the mm -hmm. country. Uh, nothing like that, but it did within our team demonstrate, like, hey, th this could work for some people. Maybe we should be more open to it. Yeah. Hi. Um, I work for a fairly small agency. We're about 10 people in the Boston area. And we are in the office around three days a week and then remote two days a week. Standard days are Wednesday and Friday. And um, my previous job wasn't like that. It was in an office and working remote was kind of just whenever you had to take your car into the shop at 11 in the morning, you know, you could work from home that day. That was fine. Um, I'm adjusting to it fairly well, um, but I'm wondering if you have any advice or if you could speak to trying to balance both working in an office and working remote, um, the context switching that's involved in that. Yeah. Uh, I, I would ask, uh, do you change what happens on those days? Like, do you use the time in the office to have more meetings or, or do the kind of work that functions better together in the office and do the work that's better done alone when you're at home? Um, even the days that we are remote, we still do have meetings. We just do them on GoToMeeting or Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, we have one employee who's basically remote every day, um, except one day a week. So it's a balance. Um, I don't, we don't really change things too much if we have client meetings and that will be a day where sure, people are sure. in person. If we need to change the day, that's fine. Yeah. Um, we have a weekly company meeting on Monday when we're all in the office. Mm -hmm. um, but generally, it seems like the, the work remote days are more or less the same. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, I think my main recommendation would be to figure out, like, are there types of work mm -hmm. that are better for one environment or the other and then yeah. alter the schedule accordingly? Okay. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm in with our client two days a week at their office, and we have dedicated Tuesday as one of the days that we, everybody comes in regardless, and, mm -hmm. and that is our dedicated meeting day, and it is, it's a lot. It's a long day, um, but it's, it's really effective for us to just have committed that, like, every Tuesday is, like, we're, not that we don't have meetings outside of that, but, like, every Tuesday, our focus is going to be getting people in a room and collaborating, um, and then, you know, we're flexible outside of that. I will say just as a general pro tip, um, one of the things that I've learned sort of having to go back and forth between um, is duplicate everything. I have an extra copy of all of the things that I need except for my laptop and that's that all of the extras stay in my backpack and my backpack is always ready to yeah. go. And I've done the same thing. I have yeah. the same the same keyboard, the same mouse yep. and the monitor. All the like, same. Even a little thing like that can really mess me up. You Definitely. Know, just having a different work environment. So. 100%. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I have two semi-related questions. Um, the first is, how do you fight the urge when you're, say, trying to take some time for yourself, watching TV or whatever, and then all of a sudden you get that spark, like, I know how to fix that problem now. My laptop's in the other room. I could 
do this and binge watch the latest Marvel show for three hours instead of taking care of myself. Um, how do you fight the urge to do that? Um, and my second question is, if you wake up in the morning, you're not feeling well. If you worked in an office, you might take the day off, but I can just sit on my couch and work for eight hours. So, you know, how do you, how do you take, uh, fight the urge to work when you really should be taking care of yourself in those situations? Yeah, I would say, um, yeah, it's, it's hard because so much of it is problem solving, right? And we have these moments in the shower, walking the dog, you're like, oh shit, I'll remember now, right? <laughs> so a lot of it is just, okay, that, that can wait, still wait till tomorrow, right? And it, the day will start off easier than it normally is because I already have things kind of progress. Um, a lot of it is just having that routine of saying, okay, I'm not working right now. I can handle it tomorrow because what I've found for myself is, yes, it may, you may have gotten farther, but sometimes you go down a rabbit hole, right? So you're like, I'm going to jump back on at six o'clock and suddenly it's nine o'clock and you're like, what happened? I'm basically spinning my wheels and then you're, uh, you know, you're burnt out for the next day. So I think that's a lot of it too, is just having those general rules, um, and just kind of following those guidelines too. I think you should still take that sick day. It's not equivalent to the snow day thing. Like, you know, you, you really need to, like, sleep and recuperate and, like, actually get better. And, like, I'll sometimes if I'm, like, a little bit ill or, whatever, you know, I'll just be like, all right, I can't get on Zoom right now. I can type to you, but, like, my sinuses are clogged or whatever. But, like, you should definitely, like, actually still take sick days and things and recuperate, have soup, sleep. You yeah. know, don't, don't push through that stuff just because you can get to your laptop. Like, it just make it worse. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, tell, and just talk directly to, you know, your project manager manager and say, hey, I'm not feeling well. I'm going to do yeah. some easy stuff for like two hours and I'm taking a nap. Bye. You know, like just communicating on that level saying I'm not feeling well enough to do the hard parts of my job, but I'm going to do the easy parts until, you know, the Sudafed or whatever kicks in. And, <laughs> you know, and then just give yourself that time to pace because, I mean, once again, for longevity, you want to pace yourself, right? And if you're just hitting it hard all the time, you're sick, you're like, I'm still going to grind through it, it wears you down. Like, it really does. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, I'll say I don't think it's too bad to follow that uh, spark of inspiration, even if it comes outside of your normal working hours. If it, if it doesn't become a habit, I think it's okay. Uh, I, I'm still thankful that uh, about a year ago, I, I had a similar spark at, I think it was like 8 p.m., well past when I normally wanted to, to work. And I followed that spark until four in the morning and I, like, I completed a coding task that I'd been thinking about uh, kind of how to do for a while. Uh, and like the spark of inspiration hit, I just followed it. I got into like that, that fun flow feeling of productive coding. And I, don't, I, I very rarely stay up until four in the morning coding, uh, but if you yeah, doing it every once in a while, I don't think that's too bad. I, I did not then attempt to work like my normal hours the next so, day. I, uh, yeah, well. and that's, and that's yeah. what I would say. You know, like, time box it. Whatever you're comfortable with, whether that is, like, I, I'm willing, like, this is, a, this is important to me and I'm willing to commit the next 10 hours to it, or this is not important to me and I'm willing to commit the next 30 minutes to it. Pick what time box fits for you when that spark hits and then accommodate for it. Like, you just worked a 12-hour day. Guess what? Like, that means that tomorrow is going to be a half day and you're going to sleep in until noon to accommodate for that. Like, communicate that to your team and make sure that, you know, A, you're sending them the message that, yeah, every once in a while, I'm going to work till four in the morning. But when I do, I'm going to be transparent about that and I'm going to expect my team to hold me accountable. And if they see me in the office at 9 a.m. the next morning, they should they should send me a snarky message and tell me to go home. Um, so I was going to jump in. One of the uh, things you also want to watch for, like if you uh, make sure to schedule things, uh, you know, that are sort of your self care things, routines, whether it's uh, making sure you get to the gym a few times a week or making sure that you're having dinner with the family or at least, or, or dinner with friends. Um, you know, those, the, if you can schedule those kinds of things and make sure that even if you get that spark of in inspiration, it doesn't necessarily impinge on, at least you're not sacrificing those things then. Um, and then, yeah, jumping, you know, if, if you want to jump on it because you know it's going to really, you know, 
make you excited and make you you're really feeling good about it, great. But if it's more that, it, but I guess the other thing I was going to say is that uh, sometimes if, if you if you if I, one one thing I've learned with writing is that um, you know if I uh, set aside an hour for myself to do some writing, and then I realize I still have you know, some ideas that I, I don't. I, I want to write them down before I lose them. Even sleeping on them, you know, they sort of percolate, and I, and they're still there in the morning when I get to it. And you almost get to the page or get to that activity, that that project, with a little more vigor, knowing that you have a solution that you really want to work on, and that's that's going to you know throw you up. That it's going to make you jump out of bed and really get to it. So I just want to touch back on the on the sick day thing, which is listen to your body, like listen to yourself the way that you would listen to a friend. Um, treat yourself the way that you would treat somebody who reports to you or to your best friend. Like if your body's saying I'm sick and I need a day off, take a day off. Like you're not doing you're not doing your team any favors um, by wearing yourself too thin, and you're not doing yourself any favors. Like you're not going to get better that way. Um, and so you know. One of the things that makes me really happy right now is you can see all of these people have water in front of them. Um, <laughs> and like, listen to yourself, drink water, like take breaks, go out for a walk, get outside. Um, if your body's saying like, I need to stretch, go stretch. If your body's saying I need to take a nap, go take a nap. Like if you want to watch that Marvel show, yeah, as long as you're getting your eight <laughs> hours in, that's kind of the benefit to your employer too. From right. like, it's like, all right, you know, whatever. I don't, I don't have a commute. I can fill that with something else and as long as you're getting your work done you can be doing it in a trailer from wherever or like you know you can go to France like just as long as you're keeping your hours in like yeah, communicating yeah, with people I, I actually had a personal one with you know, like the gym thing like um, for a while I was doing like couch to 5k and I was keeping up with it really well and I've, I've lapsed again um, what, what happened was like I would be going out in the morning make sure I get it in first thing in the morning and then like my scrum changed because I got on a new project and, you know, it, you suddenly it's like, you know, three months later when really, like, there's no reason I can't go do scrum, you know, and then go out at, like, 10 or 11. But, you know, if you, if you let like, yourself feel guilty, like, oh, I should be on my desk, you know. But you, you can really just tell your team, I'm going to go run and then come back. And as long as you're getting your time and your responsibilities, then why the hell not? That's, like, the benefit. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> definitely. I think one of the huge advantages of being able to work remotely is having the opportunity to ask yourself the critical question, am I, am I able to do my best work? And being honest with yourself and asking yourself that question, like, eh, I'm feeling a little under the weather. Am I going to do my best work today? And if the answer to that question is no, do what you need to do in order to be able to do your best work, because that, that's what probably your employer wants, right? That's, that's what your team wants, that's what your client wants, right, to whomever you're accountable. And just being really honest about, about asking yourself that question and responding appropriately goes a long way towards, towards solving those like self-care dilemmas, I think, that um, for me it, it externalizes it from like, am I being selfish to am I doing the best thing I can? Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, it's easy, I think, for us to stay relevant in our projects, but like, how do you stay relevant either outside of your department or in the company as a whole? As a remote worker, you're not always seen by everybody. So how have you guys have had some success in either communicating with other teams, other departments, in what you know, you're contributing? Uh, I think as your as uh, as a manager, speaking as a manager, um, it's up to the manager to help promote or raise visibility as to other efforts, right? As, as sorry, as far as to your reports efforts. Um, so I think that's key too, as far as like the different personalities don't like to be you know um, raised up as much, right? But you still have someone annoying like me saying, "Hey, no, we're, I'm going to embarrass you," and that's okay, you know, because you're still like uh, being a proponent for that person and still communicating that, you know, and, and being an advocate for that person. So I think that's really important just to communicate with your manager what you're doing. Um, because, you know, as managers, we love to brag, you know, on our teammates, you know, they're not our reports, they're our teammates, so. Uh, Pantheon does a weekly all company 15 minute, like Monday morning kickoff meeting. And it's common for the team I'm on to do like a one minute slide talking about something. So 
when that when that happens, I make sure that like my video call situation is good. I've got the lights turned on. Even if I'm working from home, I'm wearing a nice shirt. I've got the Pantheon sign in the background. I've practiced. I, I have practiced my like. If I expect you know a hundred people to listen to me for a minute on our Monday morning kickoff, I want to make sure like I have practiced what I'm going to say and I'm making a good impression because for some people in the company. They only see me once. You know, they they see me in that one minute every eight weeks or so. Yeah, I would agree. I would definitely agree with that. I I know one of the ways that I I try to keep engaged with my teammates um, is is I have a lot of like one on ones that you know with people that I really want to learn from. Um, and when I don't know the answer to a question, if a problem comes up on a project, I make it a point to to pick on somebody that I think might know the answer and say hey, can you spare 15 or 20 minutes to sit down with me? Um, and usually we'll spend 15 minutes talking about the problem and then another 10 minutes talking about how things are going on their project and, and sharing um, our experiences you know, together that way as well. I think Slack really helps with that. Like, I mean, you know, at Acquia, we have like a lot of um, different... It's not yeah. a topic and region channels. It's not all, you know, so, and some of them are, are not work related, which like, you know, obviously, but, you know, if, if you have a lot of people who are remote, you know, you can have a uh, different, like sort of Definitely. You know, offset, change the conversation and uh, engage with the company that way. Yeah. We have a lot of, at Palantir, we have like a food channel. We have a lot of people that love <laughs> eating um, <laughs> and cooking. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we, we try to, again, leverage some of the tools that we already use to, to, Keeping keeping contact with people outside of just like Drupal and technology, yeah. Um, I've been uh, working at home for thirty four years now. Um, not all. Of the Do you want to? Yeah. I'm not sure if that's applause worthy or not. Um, <laughs> it is. I've been doing websites for about the last ten of those years, and I. Um, think a lot and read a lot and talk a lot about work-life balance. And um, just as you said that your husband said you had no right to be telling other people about it, I still really don't have any right to be telling other people about it. So I always have good intentions and I have all these methods and, and you know some of the things you've talked about. And then I start to slip and usually I don't notice until either someone in my family feels really neglected or some of my friends feel really neglected or my, my personal well-being just isn't what it should be, not enough sleep or not enough exercise or whatever. So I want you all to say honestly how well you feel that you do maintain that balance. And what would you say to us uh, when, when we slip, as we all will? Um, I think one thing that's important is you didn't fail you know, you, you may need to make a little adjustment, but so what, what, how do you feel you're doing and what do you suggest for us? Thanks. Can I just say thank you? Um, that's, like, that's like the perfect question to end on. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I'll go down the row. Um, so we were talking earlier, I, I have a planner that I try to use Sorry. I have a planner that I use every morning um, as like a bullet journal. And there are some mornings I don't do it. There are some weeks I don't do it. And occasionally there was one month. Um, <laughs> so that's where I am. And it's not great. But that's data, right? Like that shows like when I'm slipping and failing. And that's how I know to think back and think, what were you doing? What was distracting you? And how do you pivot back to get on track? Is it possible to have the rest of the answers out in the hall? We just yeah. have to set up for the next Talk session. Yep. Sorry. Thanks. It's the first time that's happened. <laughs> <laughs> just got kicked out of the room. <laughs> my car. I saw her, and I just started hearing like, oh, the, oh, that's my the award computer. show yeah. like playoff music. <laughs> Is this your phone? Yes, it is. Oh, damn. <laughs> Thank you.
how do you deal with regions? 